Cablenet 13. Hi, I'm Ron Tite, and welcome to Queen's top-rated television show. Hi, I'm Kirsten Teague. Stay tuned, because we're going to show you why McLean's has ranked Queen's weekly television program as the number one across Canada. Yeah, right. Okay, I'm just <laughs> On a more serious note, um, we have a report on why um, Dr. McSherry, the director of the services, has re resigned. And also, we'll be looking at what's happening lately on the campus entertainment scene, such as the Medical Variety Night and the Queen's Players. Yes. But first, our top story. Well, you know what? Last year's choke from the Churchill Bowl is still fresh in our minds. Uh, the Gales got a chance to finally redeem themselves last weekend. And following a stellar performance versus Bishops the weekend before, many people wondered whether Dr. Heimlich would have to suit up to help the Gales against the Guelph Griffins. Kevin Bryanton was at the Sky Dome covering all the action. <laughs> The 1992 Churchill Bowl. In many ways, it was a lot like ancient Rome. There was a modern-day version of the Colosseum, and there was a match between man and beast. And many spectators gathered to find out who, if any, would emerge victorious from this bloodthirsty battle. And the story? Well, it was all girls. After more than a five-year absence from the Vanier matchup, this new generation of players arrived in Toronto with a mission. Having avenged their early season loss to Bishops, they were more than ready for anything new you had to throw at them. And despite TSN's early week coverage of the Queen's offense as being, quote, one-dimensional and archaic, they showed that they were none too vulnerable to the upstart Griffins, who mowed their way through both an experienced Western team and incredible odds. Now, since Guelph is associated so intimately with agriculture and hence the Earth, You'd think they'd have some sort of plan to corral the offensive force of the Gales' ground game. But don't go banking on TSN's predictions, because the leader of the rushing attack, Brad Elberg, started things off for Queens with this round-the-house run for a touchdown, which put the Gales up and left them there right through the end of the first half. 20-6 to six Gales. As the Griffins trotted into the locker room, they were understandably subdued. And by the way, just what exactly is a Griffin, anyhow? It's a Homer Simpson. In the dictionary, it says Homer Simpson. Griffin. Bad. Sucks. Oh my God, it's, it's alive! Suck. Hey, you shut up, brother. <laughs> Griffin is three-eyed animal that uh, is beating the gales. What do I think? Oh, the snow! No, what do I think? No! It's losing to the gales. That mascot is evil, I tell you. Evil. Evil. The Dome was a gathering ground for more than just a football game, however. It represented a place where old friends got together to cheer on a team to victory where it has often stumbled in the past. For some, this ritual has encompassed many, many years of cheering. So, you're an old conference Queens grad from... 60. 60? Oh my God, this guy is ancient. And for others, it has been almost a lifelong process. Queens for since 46. Since 46? Yeah, there are the ribbons. 1946. Oh my god. Yeah. That's amazing. 19 today. Wonderful. You think you're going to win this one? Or With the Gales up by yeah. 14, That's next week's matchup with the Huskies looks certain. And playing the second half seemed a mere formality. But the nervous stomachs of over 3,000 Queens fans were still trying to digest last year's second half collapse against Laurier. And when Guelph came on strong with two quick touchdowns, boy, the bile started flowing. But the hound of destiny was tamed by the Gales this year. And as it slipped the crowd a roll aid, it also literally slipped up the Griffins. This, combined with the Gales' interception in the dying moments of the game, finally nailed down the lid on Guelph and allowed the hardworking Gales to advance to Vanier and another trip to the Dome. Although they may have been beat up and worn out, finally advancing beyond the stumbling block of the CIEU championships ranks this victory amongst the sweetest. Big Brad, tough game today, but it was well worth it, eh? You've been waiting a while. Got any bet? Have, you got, have you got any more tricks for these guys next week? Well, I hope so. We'll see what we can dig up in the next week of practice. I think next is going to be an equally tough game, just like what today was. That was a good game. I think we deserve to win. We came out on top. Look for a second there. They bend you up in a pretzel formation, and you weren't going to come out. What happened there? 
I just took a shot of my head. It was no big deal. I was a little scrambles for a couple minutes, but after that, it was no big deal. Well, it's been a long, hard battle getting here, but they finally made it. This weekend, they face off against the St. Mary's Huskies at the Dome. And if you come, which I hope you do, you better bring lots of kippers and streets, because they're going to be thirsty and hungry after the big yellow guys pound them. So rush on down to the Tricolor Express office and get your ticket, so you can be there live to watch the Gales hoist the Vanier Cup. We're winning, you know it. But we will need a lot of hoopla. For Studio Fuse is Kevin Bryant and reporting from the Dome. And the smell of victory spilled over onto campus Monday afternoon for this pep rally held in the Lower Cayley. The bands were there, the cheerleaders were there, and of course, the big yellow guys were there, soaking in the queen spirit and pride from their fellow students. Another pep rally is planned for Nathan Phillips Square in Toronto for this Friday. It's organized by the Queen's Alumni Association and starts at 9 o'clock. Following the rumors, miscommunications, and whispers, Dr. McSherry, the Director of Student Health Service, recently submitted his resignation. With more, here's Studio Q reporter Crawford Smith. Thanks, Krista. Canadians have come to expect a lot from the health care system. Queen's in particular has been especially fortunate with an excellent student health services geared towards the specific need of students. Recently, however, student health has developed an illness of its own. I spoke with Dr. McSherry about the future of health services. Well, I think there's a very serious situation facing the student health service at the moment. Uh, we're caught, as it were, in a funding crisis on both sides both on the uh, question of health budgets uh, with restricted increases in OHIP fees uh, and in some cases uh, what are going to work out to be reductions in OHIP fees and at the same time with the university being hit by reduced uh, provincial funding for education. Clearly, Dr. McSherry is concerned about the current lack of funding. Health services relies on student billings for two-thirds of its budget while the remainder comes from student interest fees and a matching contribution by the university. Until April 1990, the university matched students dollar per dollar. Then the contribution dropped to 50 cents per dollar. Now there is fear that the university is trying to remove itself from the entire situation. And it is here that we find the reasons for Dr. McSherry's resignation. Uh, it appears to me that uh, the university administration uh, has or had decided that this university contribution shall be eliminated. And my concern was that this was a policy which was developing without any input from any of the people who were involved and without any real consideration for the issues of health care programs and services available to students. In addition, Dr. McSherry felt that the privatization model was being too readily embraced without completely analyzing alternative sources of funding. Foremost amongst those being some form of status quo arrangement with a reduction in the university contribution. Finally, he felt that privatization, while benefiting the administration, does nothing for all other interested parties and that ultimately Queens may be left with nothing more than a glorified walk in clinic. Staff at the health center are disheartened. He hired me to set up the health education program and he's been tremendously supportive in, in helping that kind of very progressive outreach program happen. So obviously that kind of support will be missed very much. This issue hasn't been hotly debated around campus, but it's students that will be most affected. So right now, people complain about not getting uh, appointments on time and, and uh, being rushed through and things like that. And, and uh, if anything, we need more funding, not less. And uh, it doesn't look like we're going to get that. But Health services is something we have taken for granted at Queen's, but it clearly isn't going to be the same in future years as the crisis gets worse. As for the bad guy in this whole situation, I tried to speak with Vice Principal Williams. However, he was sick and unavailable for comment. So now that Dr. McSherry has resigned, what are his plans for the future? Well, Kirst, I have a bit of bad news. He's decided to move to the Arch Enemy, and he will be teaching family medicine at Western. Well, thanks for that report, Crawford. Well, with a very well blurry of entertainment news circulating right now, Studio Q has decided to hire on Sandy Kenyon of the Hollywood Minute as our entertainment consultant. So, here's the Kingston Minute. All together now. Ba 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 ba.
This past week was entertainment packed, starting with the first performances of The Wizard of Oz at Kingston's Grand Theatre. The show continues every weekend until the end of November. Dorothy is being played by a first-year Queen student. Medical students also had the chance to show off their talent on stage in the Academy of Wards. This year's title for Medical Variety Night performed this past weekend in Grant Hall. The success of this year's show ensures that it will remain a popular annual event. Tickets went fast for the latest Queen's Players production called Beverly Hillbillies 90210. This hilarious version of the popular television series Beverly Hills 90210 played to packed audiences at Clark Hall. The John Orr Dinner, coming up on Studio Q. I don't know about everyone else, but when I was younger, I had a serious problem with times tables. Like, learning them in public school was a nightmare. <laughs> I thought yeah. they were so difficult. Like, you used to draw little circles, and did you learn that way? I had a calculator. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow. Calculator, digital watch, and Velcro shoes. Learning was very minimal when I was a kid. But, you know, there's a play called Ten Times Table, apparently going on right now, and maybe Pat McLean can tell us about that. Every year, the Queen's Drama Department produces two major productions, one in the fall and one in the spring. This year's fall production is Alan Akeborn's British comedy, Ten Times Table, which is being performed this week in the Drama Department's Convocation Hall Theatre. I had an opportunity to chat with some of the people involved and take a sneak preview at what the audience can expect this week. The play is set in a hotel conference room in the town of Pendon. A man named Ray Dixon has set up a committee to organize a pageant to celebrate the history of the town. The comedy revolves around the various problems the committee encounters. And the conflict uh, in the show centers on the fact that this committee ends up breaking up into two functions. Uh, factions, factions. Factions, sorry. Factions. Into two factions that end up sort of clashing and, and taking against one another. Yeah. And inevitably, as in all British comedy, the whole thing falls apart. Yeah. What makes the play work well is the variety of characters involved in the committee. Uh, I play Eric Collins, a teacher. A uh, communist school teacher. A me method acting. I spent lots of time drinking and uh, falling off horses and things like that. My name's Audrey Evans. I've raised a son and I'm um, a strong female character. Convocation Hall is one of three theaters in Theological Hall used by the drama department to produce a variety of productions involving student actors and technical and production crews. Uh, basically, the best thing to do would probably be to come down to the drama department, talk to people down here, and check out the board that lists um, auditions, and just sign up and get involved that way. Uh. It's all about lighting now, isn't it? I mean, what can an actor do in the dark? Not very much. So, If you're worried about how much talent you need, just ask Andy Poole, who plays Ray Dixon. Mm, I guess the, the first thing you need to do is be able to read, because they post audition notices. And so you, I guess you have to be able to write as well because you have to sign your name up and you have to be able to tell the time as well because when you sign your name, you sign to a specific time. I'm not really trained to speak on stage. I just move furniture. <laughs> so take a look. Ten Times Table runs through Saturday at Convocation Hall Theatre. For Studio Q, I'm Pat McLean. For several years, a pain for Kingston residents has been the student ghetto, or using a more politically correct term, the student housing area. In an attempt to address these concerns of citizens, the city planning has cut through their own red tape to produce a three-phase report on the area. Molly Finley has the details. James Moxon, like many Queen uh, students, here, knows firsthand the problems of ghetto yeah, housing. We actually had a hole slowly Behind forming, us. and we and had the top of our ceiling, which was leaking plaster and water down into our ceiling and falling down over the air, and it took him about a year and a half to fix it. With tuition fees rising and jobs hard to find, many students will live with the hassles if the price is right. It, uh, for the problems that we have, he keeps it nice and low, so which probably explains why he doesn't really come by here and uh, make any uh, amendments or fixes it up. Our, rent is very cheap. The recently released student accommodation review prepared by the city of Kingston has been discussed widely within the AMS. Recently at the open forum on student housing a variety of different views were heard. 
The review recommends that student housing be a designated land use, but this zoning restriction angers some who feel the policy will discriminate against students. City officials also want to add more bylaw officers to enforce external problems like garbage and rowdiness. But critics of the review feel that the city is trying to use urban planners to solve behavioral and landlord problems amongst students, problems that should be attacked at their roots. Don Rogers, city councillor, advocates the review. Trying to come up with, with a solution that everybody can have good, affordable housing uh, with a min minimum of hassle. However, newly elected rector David Barr feels that the review is not geared towards the needs of students. I said at the uh, uh, planning committee meeting a couple of weeks ago, he said that as a current landlord, this proposal would benefit him because it would limit all future development of student housing and would allow him to charge more for his homes without improving anything of quality and even letting them deteriorate. However, students have a responsibility in the matter. Encourage students to be more responsible towards the community and to deal with the, the landlords who are problem landlords. The Student Housing Review is a good start to investigating the student housing challenge. But it will be years before the recommendations are in place and students and long-term residents see any benefits. For Studio Q, I'm Molly Finley reporting. It's 4.30 and the campus is dead. Do you wonder where all these Queen students disappear to? Let's go inside and find out. Um, I come to share time with my friends at the Quiet Pub <laughs> over a Coke and the Weinar just happens to be on. I love the Weinar because I guess I like the storylines. I like the stories. I find them more, I find them sort of not necessarily realistic, but sort of humorously, humorously it applies to everyone's life a bit. I watch it every day probably since grade 11. I watch it for Miguel, really. <laughs> He's the center of the whole plot, I think. <laughs> During a school year, on and off, maybe three times a week or something. The plot? Sure. They get all these new plots and they keep kind of, you know, meshing them over and it just, it's addictive really. I mean, you can't stop watching. It's horrible. Then you get hooked on it just to see how badly it's going to happen. And so now it's pathetic. <laughs> I'm watching them all the time. It's my favorite storyline is probably the one with Victoria and Ryan, just because it's just so unrealistically cheesy that I love it. So realistic. <laughs> like, yeah, I've been there. <laughs> Who's that guy in the, in the office with, uh, what's Brad. her name? Yeah, Brad and Lauren. Lauren. Brad and Lauren are definitely going to kiss soon. Totally kissing. Why do we... I think they're going to figure out that um, Victoria is not, well, of course wasn't 18 when she got married, but used a fake ID and a nullet. And I think she's going to find the million dollars in his pocket because he's, I think, pretty sure he's still carrying it. Definitely a closet YNR fan. You don't want to be a, an open YNR fan anywhere because it's sort of got a bad stigma attached to it, I think. So I'd say I'm definitely in the closet. Closet YNR fans don't want too many people to know. I don't watch what <laughs> embarrassed about it. Yeah, I do. I'm in the process, yeah. No, I've admitted to people that I watch it. And, uh, but I, I must admit that my housemates conscientiously choose not to watch it because they know that if they watched it, they would get sucked in. If you've never had a daily addiction before and you're looking for a little entertainment, you can join the rest of the Queen's students in watching The Young and the Restless. For Studio Q, this is Fiona McCauley reporting. I'm just looking here, and one of the one of the benefits of being an alumni is that y you get to go to this Bobby Orr dinner, which to me, I mean, that that would be a dream come true, Bobby Orr dinner with all these hockey greats there, Guy Lafleur. I, I bet Don Cherry is there. Ron, I mean, <laughs> it's what? a John Orr dinner. John. John Orr. <laughs> Who the hell's John Orr? I don't know. <laughs> it's an alumni dinner. I don't know. Okay. Well, with more on the John or dinner, here's Bruce Valerie. Saturday, November 14th, the Metro Toronto Convention Center. 
The hair was coiffed and the finery adorned for a formal night on the town. The excuse was the John Orr Dinner, an annual event hosted by the Toronto branch of the Queen's Alumni Association. Though not a big fundraiser, it's an annual pilgrimage that keeps the ties to Queen's strong. But the main purpose is to recognize the winner of the John Orr Award, the most prestigious recognition of long-term commitment to the life and welfare of Queen's. This year it was bestowed upon Dr. Elspeth Baugh, former Dean of Residences and longtime Dean of Women. When I think about the 38-year span in which this branch has honored Queen's people and the 26 awards given, I have to believe that in the past some very worthy women were overlooked. I salute the branch for their affirmative action program. Two awards to women in three years is an individual record. Baugh's father was principal of the university, so she literally grew up on campus. After raising six children, she returned to Queens in 1980 to fill the post of Dean of Women and serve as advisor, confidant, and friend. Baugh says she was very honored to be named alongside John Orr, a man she knew personally. Terribly kind, uh, high integrity, great commitment to the university. I love him a lot, and I have a lot of respect for him. Of course, a traditional Queen's bash followed the formalities. The bands were on hand to lead the 1,000 guests in Queen's songs, signaling that the carousing could begin. And no one plays disciplinarian tonight. There wasn't a student constable in sight. Well, I think it's a great chance for everyone to get together and just enjoy one big award for us with Bob. There's an innate desire to get together once a year and uh, relive all that we had in Kingston. Recent graduates are also in attendance, maybe for a quick fling back to more carefree times. But I've seen a lot of buns and tomatoes flying, so that gives you an idea of what you can look for in the John Orr dinner in the coming years. For Toronto alumni, this remains their annual injection of Queen Spirit, awakening yet again memories of their university days. For Studio Q, I'm Bruce Celery in Toronto. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to live the jet-setting lifestyle of a diplomat or to debate international policy for hours on end? Well, the only way to truly satisfy your curiosity is to experience it. As Juliet Napton found out, it's no joke. It's the model UN. In 1945, the world needed an international forum to discuss global issues. The United Nations was formed to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights, to establish conditions under which justice and respect can be maintained, and to promote social progress and better standards of life and larger freedom. Uh, the director of the General Assembly will now call the roll. Canadians have always been an active UN participants, and the United Nations simulations exist for youth across the country. The first-hand experience in diplomacy and negotiation are quite unique. We also sympathize with Canada's situation, as described by Mr. Pierre Trudeau, as lying beside a sleeping elephant, as we have a large restless bear next door to worry about. So you get a, a re-picture of your own size in the whole network of things. But nevertheless, it's, it's a very tangible thing that I accomplished this, this week. And so I just, I just come away with an incredible feeling. The United Nations is where the aspirations and idealism of a country are often tempered by reality. It is where we are reminded of just how interconnected the world is. And it is a realization of how powerful and yet how weak and finite we really are. Queen's Mall United Nations will be hosting its seventh annual conference at Grand Hall in February. 500 delegates from across North America will come together to exchange ideas on a variety of international issues and attempt to capture some of the spirit of the United Nations. The 1993 conference is larger in size and scope than ever before. And when did CUMA start? Seven years ago? Seven years ago. And, and why did it start? Because they wanted an opportunity for students to be exposed to international issues that might not necessarily come up in their classes. And as an opportunity to simulate being a diplomat for a weekend and getting away with the murder that they do. <laughs> and the growth of international uh, interest, uh, especially here at Queen's, uh, has enabled uh, the conference to grow uh, from a much larger dimension. Cuban Secretary General Christine Lonsdale is thrilled to have two well-known speakers addressing the conference. For Strong, the Secretary General of the Earth in Rio is going to be coming and speaking on Saturday. And um, General Lewis McKenzie, the commander of the UN forces in Yugoslavia, is coming in. I love doing this stuff. Um, it's very interesting to hear different perspectives, different people's views 
on what's going on. And you meet amazing people that way. I mean, you, it's 500 people coming from such diverse walks of life. You'll never be able to meet so many people in one weekend again. The Queen's Mall United Nations has its first meeting at 6 o'clock in Sterling Hall B and a smoker at Clark on November 23rd. For Studio Q, I'm Juliet Nats Fording. Hi, I'm Lenore McAdam, the producer of Studio Q. This week, we're running a contest for free tickets to the Vanier Cup this Saturday. The first three callers to phone 545-6699 will win a pair of tickets to the Vanier Cup this Saturday at the Sky Dome in Toronto. All you have to do is phone here at 545-6699 and tell me the correct score of last week's football game against Guelph. The number again is 545-6699. This contest is only valid for Thursday, November 19th. Thanks and good luck. Great. Uh, just a reminder, everyone, that the Tree of Life charity for Children Day Society put on by the USSQ is going on right now in the Jidak. Uh, that's where you go down, you pick up an, an ornament, and it has on it a... You just you take an ornament off the tree, and then you give them your name and your phone number, and you have two weeks to buy a gift, and there's a name of a person, a boy or girl, and their age on the ornament, and then you bring the gift back at the end of the two weeks. It's so a great idea. It's a really great yeah. idea. I've got to buy a gift for a two-year-old boy, so... Oh, that's great. That's, what do you buy for a two-year-old boy, though? Encyclopedias? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to go in, actually, uh, with our house. Um, oh, your house. Yeah, because yeah. money's tight, so and that's it's a good idea. Yeah, that's a good idea, too. Because I don't think there's a, they say a limit for money. No. It's just whatever. No, but whatever nine, you can nine, afford. 900, 950, something like that. Oh, Ron. <laughs> and we'd also like to thank the Student Publishing and Copy Center for all of their support over the past uh, years for Studio Q. Yeah. And next week, there's a rumor, well, I don't know if there's a rumor yet, but there might be a rumor that we may be taping at the Sky Dome. And this rumor possibly could be true, so you better tune in next week. You never know. You never know. <laughs> All right, we'll see you next week then. I'm Ron Tite. I'm Kirsten Teague. See ya. See ya. Studio Q, Queen's weekly television show, is brought to you each week by CableNet 13 and Queen's Alma Mater Society. Tune in next week, Thursday at 6 o'clock and Friday at 4.30 on CableNet 13. Stay tuned to CableNet 13 for more of the finest community programming for the Kingston-Gananoque area.